Living polymerization and block copolymers and their effect on nanomedicine. Presented by Joseph Horton. Living polymerization is an amazingly useful technique to the modern nanochemist that is as we speak leading a revolution within the medicinal world and month to month new discoveries are made regarding better drug transportation and effectiveness against MDR cancers, multi-drug resistant cancers. It was first proposed in 1936 by one Carl Ziegler who hypothesized that it would be possible to use a nucleophilic electron donating initiator to start an addition polymerization reaction that has no chain transfer or termination steps. But it wasn't until 1956 and a man called Michael Zwark and co-workers to prove that it was possible. Now the idea of a nucleophile, electron donator, attacking a carbon-carbon double bond is a bit hard to accept seeing as you are trying to add an electron to an already electron rich bond. For example, pause the video now and go out and buy a packet of Jacob's Cream Crackers. If you're one of the people who always keep Jacob's Cream Crackers handy by your PC, congratulations for the day it has finally paid off. Got them? Good. Now pause the video again and eat half of them without any water. Done that? Good. You are now modelling an electron rich carbon carbon double bond with the crackers in your mouth. Now try and eat the other half of the packet. Hard? Good! Now if you actually did that I applaud you for your willingness to make a fool of yourself for science. If you did not do that then I disapprove of your lack of commitment. But you can probably imagine the outcome. So how do you persuade a nucleophile that it is a good idea to attack an electron rich carbon carbon double bond? By having a very electron withdrawing group attached to that bond. This makes the double bond less electron rich and more susceptible to attack from a nucleophile. Imagine, if you will, the state of mind you're in after a night out. Alcohol has robbed your cognitive functions and you're stumbling home when you spy a kebab van. Now usually you wouldn't look twice at said van, but the effects of alcohol make the idea of a kebab much more appealing. So you accept and make what would usually be a disastrous transaction and walk away gleefully chewing on your kebab. In this rather tenuous analogy, the alcohol represents the electron withdrawing group and shows how this extra incentive allows the nucleophile to attack the double bond. Once bonded, the carbanion, carbon with a minus charge, is also stabilised by the electron withdrawing group if it is a minus M group, e.g. an ester or carboxylic acid, through the use of resonance forms so that the minus charge is spread across a larger area, because we all know that a build-up of charge is a very bad thing. This can be likened to a piece of toast with marmite on, if you're like me who likes marmite in small quantities, which probably makes me in the minority, but I'll run with it anyway. Imagine two nice crunchy slices of brown toast with marmite on. One has a massive dollop of marmite right in one corner, with the rest of the toast bare. A disappointing breakfast. Whereas the other is thinly spread with marmite so the entire slice is covered. Much better! This is what the minus M group does. Help spread the marmite, I mean electron density, across a large area, making it much more delicious, I mean stable. Hang on, I'm hungry now. Welcome back. So, this is the initiation step of anionic living polymerization. And the important thing to remember about this step is that it happens very fast in comparison to the next step. So, for every molecule of the initiator, a polymer chain is formed with a living end, the carbanion, carbon with a minus charge. This then propagates through basically the same reaction. The carbanion acts as a nucleophile and bonds with another carbon carbon double bond and moves the living carbon to the end of the molecule. Now this reaction goes at a very predictable rate. Thus, because all of the polymer chains were created basically at the same time, the chains grow at the same rate. So the polymer chains are all of very similar molecular weight and lengths. They have a very low value for their polydispersity. Using this, chemists can design a polymer and make a defined amount of it, and also be able to make it an exact length. So you have 0.1 moles of the initiator, that means you will end up with 0.1 moles of the polymer. And if you add 1 mole of the monomer to 0.1 moles of the initiator, you will get a polymer that is 1 over 0.1 equals 10 repeat units long. What's even more useful is that after all the monomer is used up, the living end is still reactive, so you can add more of the monomer and it will continue going, or you could add a different monomer and create block copolymers with defined blocks of different monomers. This allows you to mix and match properties with the different blocks within the polymer. Basically, it's like genetic engineering, taking the best of two things and combining them, except without the whole controversy thing. And to counter the unequivocal amount of pure chemistrynessness in the past minute or so, here is an image of someone climbing a mountain to re-inspire you. One extremely useful application of block 
copolymers is using them in nanomedicine, and one of the most promising of all block copolymers are pleuronics, or polyaxmas. These are made up of hydrophilic, water-loving, polyethylene oxide, PEO, and hydrophobic, water-hating, polypropylene oxide, PPO, blocks arranged in an ABA tri-block structure, PEO, PPO, PEO. This makes a block copolymer, which is a hydrophilic outer layer and a hydrophobic center, kind of like an old-school jammy dodger has jam, hydrophobic, sandwiched between two crunchy biscuits, hydrophilic. Okay, I think I'm taking this analogy thing a bit too far. These copolymers are amphiphilic, both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, so they have a lot of interesting properties, chiefly the ability to interact with hydrophobic substances and biological membranes. This makes these polymers amazingly useful for transportation of hydrophobic drugs within the body. This is achieved when the concentration of the copolymer is above the critical Micilles concentration, CMC, at which point the polymer self-assembles into a ball-shaped structure with the hydrophilic ends facing outwards and the hydrophobic ends facing inwards, towards the centre. In simple terms, this creates a Trojan horse in which you can store water-insoluble drugs. The PEO shell has the added bonus of keeping the drug in a dispersed state where it is less likely to have unwanted interactions with normal cells and protein, and having the ability to carry the hidden drug across the intestinal border and the blood-brain barrier. Also, it turns out that not only do these amazing Trojan horses allow for the transport of water-insoluble drugs into the cancer cell, but they also make MDR cancers more sensitive to the drug through a number of different steps. It changes the microviscosity of the membrane of the cancer cell, it causes the ATP adenosine triphosphate levels to decrease, which basically stops energy being transported around the cell. It even goes as far as repressing the cancer cell's drug um, efflux system, its ability to throw out unwanted drugs. But it turns out that these effects are more prevalent in the non micellistic weather version of the polymer. So the unimer is more effective at making the cell more sensitive. Think of the unimers as the assassins that sneak into the city of Troy and murder all the guards, and the Micilles is the classic Trojan horse. But why, I hear you cry, does this amazingly tactical-minded chemical not attack healthy cells? Well, the truth is, it does. A bit. But it is more likely to attack cancer cells via the Enhanced Permeability and Retention, EPR, effect, which isn't really relevant to this presentation. Another cutting-edge application of pleuronics is actually fixing damaged cells. Usually, once a cell has been damaged, that's it. You try and save the cells you can and to limit the damage. But with researchers Raphael Lee and K. Yi Lee, this might soon change. Basically, what causes cell death is holes in the membrane. The membrane regulates what goes in and out of the cell, keeping all the good stuff in and all the bad stuff out. But when holes appear, this ability is gone, and the act of diffusion means that the inside of the cell diffuses out and the outside diffuses in. Cell death. But as Palaxma 188, you can plug the holes. Of course, this plug won't be able to act as the phospholipid and protein membrane and act as a transport system in and out of the cell, but it will stop the act of diffusion from causing cell death. Imagine the tent. The canvas is the membrane of the cell and allows air in and out so the occupant can survive, but keeps the water out so the occupant can be comfortable. When the membrane canvas gets holes in it, water is allowed in and the occupants get very wet. But if you patch up the tent with plastic squares, voila, no more rain in. Yes, the plastic doesn't let air in, but the rest of the canvas still does. This is just a quick look at the limitless possibilities that arise when you combine polymer chemistry with nanomedicinal chemistry. Thank you for watching.